morning, everyone. May God bless you and keep you on this beautiful morning, July 10th, July 10th, 2022. I want to thank God for allowing uh, me the opportunity to wake up and see another day today, for it was by his will that I'm able to see another day. So I thank, uh, thank God for my parents. I thank God for their upbringing, thanking them for uh, all the things that they have provided for me as a child, uh, getting me to this point for if it wasn't for my parents, wasn't for my parents and that community of folks, aunts and uncles and cousins and all those around, around me to make me the person I am today, where would I be today? So I thank them for their guidance and their protection, their, their words of encouragement and their prayers. So let's go to God in prayer. Uh, we're going to come out of the book of Isaiah today, the 42nd chapter of Isaiah 42, 1 through 8. But we're going to focus just on three key verses. But let's go to God in prayer first. Dear Lord, thank you for uh, allowing us to wake up and see another day today. We thank you for the blessings that you have bestowed upon us, Lord. Even though we didn't ask for them, you provided them anyway. Whether it was food, shelter, uh, clothing, uh, community, uh, uh, transportation, uh, money in our pockets, uh, life insurance, health insurance, uh, uh, a doctor, uh, someone to listen to, someone who provides mental health counseling for us in times of need, in times of, uh, of sorrow, in times of discomfort, in times of the insurity of where the world is headed today. So Lord, bless us today. But not only that, Lord, bless these, these leaders that you have placed uh, in, 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 in positions of authority who are not listening or who are not paying attention to the goodness or the word of God that they have turned around and turned to do their own thing and that they are just walking around with itching ears, uh, seeking uh, prosperity, seeking power above all things and forgetting about the people that they are uh, supposed to be serving. So bless them and keep them today. Bless their communities, their families, keep them safe. But I pray that there will be a shift, that there will be a turnaround in their hearts and minds and in their souls, that they begin to look up into the stars and look up into the skies and begin to ask God for direction and not themselves. So Lord, bless us and keep us on this day. And it is in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. We're going to come out of the book of Isaiah, the 42nd chapter, verses 1 through 8. And as I stated, we're going to focus on three main verses, right? Because this is heavy. This is really, really heavy what Isaiah is telling us in the 42nd chapter today. Let's read it in its entirety, these first eight verses. Isaiah 42, 1 through 8. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out, nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail, nor be discouraged, till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands shall wait for his law. Verse 5, Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it. Verse 6, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand, and I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out of prison from the prison those who sit in darkness. From the prison house, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. What is God talking about here? God is telling Isaiah, right, that there, you know, there's, there's two things I want to preface here. Uh, if you've went to the book of Luke, uh, the seventh chapter, verses 19 to 24, it speaks of Christ. Uh, talking to those around him when John the Baptist is thrown in prison. And he turns to these Pharisees and he turns to everyone in his audience at that time. He says, what did you go out to see, right? A reed shaking in the wind, right? But long before that, right, right before that, uh, John, John the Baptist's disciples come to Christ and say, are you the Christ or we should be seeking another, right? And Jesus answered them saying, go and tell John the things you have seen and heard that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offered, who is not offended because of me. This correlation between what Christ is saying is like, you know, since Christ is, he, he is, uh, he's omnipresent, he is omniscient, he's in all places at all times. He's aware of the passages of scriptures of Isaiah. 
He can quote them because he was there. He created all these, these moments of time. And he's actually quoting the book of Isaiah, the 42nd chapter, when he's having this conversation, uh, telling John the Baptist's uh, disciples about, yes, I, that I am the one. Because if you have read the book of Isaiah, or if you know about Isaiah, which was a mighty prophet indeed, and many of them were aware of Isaiah, then they would know where Christ was coming from in this passage of Scripture, in the, in the passage of Luke, right? And when he's talking about blind, that the blind see, it means that those who are walking in darkness, those uh, literally walking in darkness, those that physically, physically cannot see, plus those who are spiritually blind is what he is prefacing today. So he's telling John the Baptist that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are clean, the deaf hear, the deaf hear meaning that those who, uh, you, know, uh, you know, he that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit of the Lord has to say. What he's saying to John the Baptist's disciples at the time is that those who have a willingness to listen and to understand who I am, that I am the Son of God, that I am the Messiah, right, will hear me and will accept me. So that's in the book of Luke. Now, this is 700 years, Isaiah, 700 years before the birth and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So it's amazing how uh, Christ is, is pretty much putting at ease while John the Baptist is in stocks as his, as his disciples come and tell him that, yeah, that he is the one. And these are the things that uh, he, he said he would do. Well, John the Baptist is very aware of the book of Isaiah and is aware of the fact that, wait a minute, that's what Isaiah said. So this must be the Christ. So I am rest assured that if they, if they were to destroy me today, if they were to martyr me today, I am rest assured that I was the forerunner, right? I am the one who, who, who set the valley straight, the, the mountain straight, and the, the low places straight So to make a way for, for the Messiah, and he is the one. So I am rest assured that he is the one, that we don't need to ask, is there another? And then also for the Jews, right? The Jews need to understand because the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and all those religious leaders at that time are very much aware of the book of Isaiah as well. So when they read the book of Isaiah and they've studied it thousands and thousands of times, when you hear this coming out of Jesus Christ's mouth, you begin to say, could this be the one, right? Is this the one, right? So that's what this is all about. So this Isaiah 42, 1 and 8, right? Um, when we look at this very first uh, this very first verse, behold my servant whom I uphold, right? My elect one in whom my soul delights, right? Can you imagine God saying that to you? Actually, he is saying that to you, each and every one of us, each and every day, no matter our, our circumstances, no matter how many times we turn our backs on him, no matter how many times we despise and, and lie and cheat and, 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 and hate our brothers, right? that Christ is still, that God is still, that the Holy Spirit is still giving us another chance, just one more opportunity to save our souls, right? We are the elect, right? In whom his soul delights, right? God's soul delights in us. I have put my spirit upon him. Now he's talking about Jesus Christ. I have put my spirit upon him. This is 700 years before his son comes, right? And dies for us. And he will bring forth justice to the Gentiles meaning that he will scale, there will be a balance, right? I'm going to weigh out, I'm going to weigh uh, your, your, you know, your, um, your uh, righteousness and your unrighteousness, your sin and, and all these things that you're going through. I'm going to balance those things out, but I am going to be the one who will die for all of those sins, right? So no matter how much you transgress, so matter, so matter, so matter what you have done in your life, I am there to forgive you of all sins if you are the elect, if you have been chosen by me. So as I say, it's 700 years. This is 700 years, right? Before the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Isaiah is a prophet of God who, who, who was told by God that the lives of the Gentiles would be changed forever through the coming of his chosen servant. Now, when you read Isaiah, what's happening is you, you have to uh, oftentimes really read it slow and determine, okay, who is the servant? Well, what he's talking about in his very first verse is that the servant is Israel, and in, in, the, in, the, in that very stanza, and then it says that, um, then he starts speaking about his son, which is Jesus Christ. So the this, this servant is Israel, a chosen one sent by God, right? The servant is one that is held in high esteem by God, one who delights in, right? God delights in Israel. So the purpose of his coming, right, was to look ahead and restore all mankind from a life of sin and death to a life eternal, as long as you believed and trusted in him and had faith 
in him and the one that God was sending, right? We often look towards the future with uncertainty, and yet those who believe, the true believers, look to the future with optimism and much hope, right? No matter what's going on in the world today, all these different crazy things that's going on today that we just cannot understand and we have no control over, we feel that we have no control over, God did state that these things would come to pass and they would be like these birth pangs and it would get, it would get, uh, it would get worse, right? So we have to pay attention to these things, right? But we look to all these things in life with optimism and hope, right? Because if now all these things that he said are coming to pass, then surely then our prayers, everything that we're praying for, all the faith and trust and hope and the assurity of life eternal coming from him, it must come to pass for all those, the very elect that he has chosen. Amen. Rick Warren said that without God, life has no purpose. And without purpose, life has no meaning. And without meaning, life has no significance or hope. Rick Warren said this, right? He said that without God, life has no purpose. And without purpose, life has no meaning. And without meaning, life has no significance or hope. Why are you living if you don't trust and believe in God, right? Do you put all of your faith and trust in material things? in your 12-bedroom house, in the five cars that you have in the driveway, right? In, in the lake house that you have, in the ocean villa that you have, do you put all your, are, are, can all those things bring you salvation, right? It's what Rick Warren is saying, right? Without meaning, life has no significance or hope. You need God in it. God, without God, life has no purpose. So you can enjoy all those things through God, right? Not saying that they're all wrong, but as long as you're doing it, through God, and, and, and wake up each and every day with tears in your eyes, thanking God for all these things that he has blessed you with, and then you're giving away more than what God has given you, then, then you should have a clear conscience. But if you're doing it to uplift yourself, right? And this is what God is talking about in 42, is idols, right? And we're going to get to that in a moment. Is the fact that the Jewish people at this time were consumed with idols because their neighbors were consumed with idols, Okay? But a much, much larger statement, much, much larger statement, right, of what Rick Warren is saying is one that we're very familiar with today. One that we always see, right, today. When we see baseball games and football games and championships, right, we see 316 or John 316, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That is the hope and the assurance of a God that truly loves us and wants to have us in his life, right? So the title of this passage of scripture, the title of this message today is, and I apologize for this, is that I am the Lord, that is my name. I am the Lord, that is my name. I, lo I love this, right? <clears throat> God does not mince words. So this is the objective in life, right? As believers, to believe in him so that we may not fall into eternal damnation. So whether you're 10 years old, 11 years old, 12 years old, and you've learned who Jesus Christ is, you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and uh, personal Savior, right? When you get to the age of knowledge and an age of knowing who he is, now you are held accountable. Now you have this personal, intimate relationship with him, right? And you begin to walk in the newness of life. This is the objective in life, to believe in him so that we may not fall into eternal damnation, darkness, and despair, and the pain of an eternal death that, just, that has been described in the Bible as unconscionable right? Unconscionable. We cannot even, I don't even want to imagine what hell looks like, smells like, right? I don't want to care. I don't want to know. I don't want to hear the noises. I don't, I don't want to, I don't, I, I don't even want to know nothing about hell, but hell does exist. And one thing preachers must preach today is continue to tell people that there is a hell. And because God is giving you all these things and all these chances, opportunity after opportunity after opportunity, right? to change your life, to change your ways, to change your ways. And people keep telling you to change your ways, to do the right thing, do the right thing, do the right thing. And you choose not to, there is a hell that he will put you in because that could be the knock. When people are telling you that's not the right way to go and you refuse to do it, that is the Holy Spirit telling you, you need to change your ways because this hell is unconscionable. So if I truly believe and confess to Christ and trust in him, I will receive a greater glory, right? A greater reward 
in which life eternal through Christ, the one whom God has sent to save me. They are these crowns of life, right? These five crowns, like crown of righteousness and uh, crown, crown of salvation and these five crowns that, that, that God uh, tells us about all throughout Scripture that we will receive if we trust and believe in him when we go into paradise, when we go into salvation, that we will receive a crown of life. If that, I don't even need a crown, right? Just let me in, right? I'll be glad to see other people with their crowns. But just, Lord, but if you want to give me a crown, that's fine. But I, I don't need one. Just let me in. Because as I stated, there is a hell. And it is unconscionable. And it is a place that you do not want to be. Because it is a place where God will bring to remembrance all the opportunities, all the chances you had to change your life. And he will remind you in hell, right, of that one shot, that one chance when someone said, repent, right, and you chose not to, or to turn from your wicked ways. At that moment, God would have secured you and protected you and kept you on the right path, but you chose not to, and you will live that for an eternity, right? Scripture says that there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That means that people will be crying and in anguish, right, in much pain and despair for an eternity, thinking over and over and over again about that one chance that they had to save themselves to live with Christ in paradise. Hmm. So if you truly believe and confess to Christ and trust in him, right, I will receive a greater glory, a greater reward, which is life eternal through Christ, the one whom God sent to save me, right? So oftentimes we look down. Oftentimes we don't think about what Christ actually did, that he is the son of God, that he it is the, it is the, Holy, it's the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, that God himself came in, in his flesh. The situation was so dire that God himself had to come in the flesh, right, to die for us, to prove how much he loved us. Think about that when you get a chance. The situation was so dire, right, that all of us were going to hell, that all of us, all this creation, all everything that he's created for his good pleasure, all of us, right, all of our souls, would be lost in eternal damnation. So he sent his son in the likeness of him to die for us, gave up his richness and became poor for us to give us a chance at salvation. Point number one, Israel, the servant of God. Israel, the servant of God. God has chosen the Messiah for his great work, just as the apostles were selected for their great work as well, right? So the work of the Messiah was to transform the world through this new covenant, okay? The covenant of praise and of worship and how much, you know, how, how must he do this through the purpose and quietness? How, how will he do it? Through quietness, the scripture says. Let's read this passage of scripture. Verse 2, he shall not cry nor lift up nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. Let's repeat that, that he shall not cry nor lift up nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. He will do this in quietness, right? When we think about this, about the small voice that spoke to Elijah, right, while he was on the run from Queen Jezebel, who was trying to kill him, right? It is that same voice that speaks to us today, right? And through us by the Holy Spirit, because the scripture says that, you know, Christ, you know, God wasn't in the earthquake. He wasn't in the wind. He wasn't in the fire. He wasn't in all this. But when all that ended, as Elijah is standing out on this mountain, with his scarf wrapped around his head in, in fear, right? Hearing the small voice of God say, why are you here? Right? That is God speaking to us in quietness. And as the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit speaks to us in quietness. He doesn't yell at us, right? Oftentimes people are enthroned, but you know, by, by people who are yelling and screaming at them, you know, about who God is and this, 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 right? That is their style and it reaches thousands of people. But then there are other people who just speak about the truth of God, right? We all have these different gifts, all these different spiritual gifts of how to reach those through the Holy Spirit, how to reach those and have them listen to us about who God is, right? But God speaks to us in quietness. He speaks to us in quietness. He gets our full attention. That's what that verse 2 says, that he shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. I will have this intimate relationship with you. And I will just speak to you in a quiet, solemn voice. That way you will hear me when I speak to you because I'm just speaking to you and not to the crowd. I'm just having a conversation with you. 
So in this verse, it speaks of the servant, right? When reading it quickly, you might miss it. The servant is Israel, as I've stated, which is their divinely appointed mission. It is their divine appointed mission, right? To serve God. Psalm 115, but our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. I chose Israel, even though they don't accept me as their, as their savior, right? I still love them anyway, because I made a promise to Abraham, right? God does whatever he pleases. So we know this because God said, I have put my spirit upon him, the Holy Spirit. This is the spirit of love, a spirit of compassion, a spirit of forgiveness, right? The book of Exodus 34 and 6 says that God bears long and is slow to anger, right? He continuously gives us opportunity after opportunity, no matter how much we mess up. But I wouldn't want to mess up so many times that God just finally gives up on me. Amen? That's what we're talking about today. Don't keep pushing God to a point, trying God to a point, to where you think that he has given you all the slack in the world. The slack will soon leave to, uh, run out. Right? It will soon tighten up, and that's when you have to make a decision. God bears long and is slow to anger. Long-suffering right, is proof of God's goodness. Long-suffering. I'm going to wait for you. I'm going to be faithful with you. I'm going to be patient with you. I'm going to guide you and trust you, but you got to trust in me. Right? If I tell you to go this direction, I want you to go this direction. If I tell you to do X, I want you to do X and not Y. Right? God bears long and is slow to anger. Long-suffering is proof of God's goodness, faithfulness, and his desire to grant us salvation, right? So as I have listeners in, in South Africa and, and parts of the world, do know that, that we are serving the same God. And even though you look out over the, the oceans and you see what's going on in this nation and we see what's going on all over the world, that this is the same God, the same God that still says, I love you. It's all about long-suffering and patience. I will not be angry with you. I will not shout at you, but I will speak to you in a quiet voice because that is the most intimate way I can get your attention is to know that I have this intimate relationship with you, and then you will finally listen to me. Hmm. Romans 2 and 4 describes God as forbearing and long-suffering. Or do you, the scripture says, or do you or do you despise the riches of his goodness, his forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads us towards repentance? Right? The more I just talk to you like a parent does to a child, if you're yelling at that child, they cease to stop listening to you. But when you just speak to them over time and time again, please clean up your room. Please do your homework. Please clean up your room. Please do your homework. Eventually, they'll realize that you're doing it for their goodness and for your good pleasure as well, right? You get better results that way. Psalm 94, 19 says, In the multitude of my thoughts and within, within me, thy, thy comforts and delights my soul. Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And in Isaiah 66, 13, as a mother comforts her son, so will I comfort you and you will be consoled over Jerusalem. God has this unique purpose for each and every one of us in our lives today, right? We oftentimes don't see it. We don't recognize it. But if we allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us and guide us, then we will get it right each and every time. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles, Scripture says. This same God who is filled with long-suffering and patience will provide a way toward salvation to all those who have chosen to believe on him, in him, to follow him, Jew and Greek. God is this great orchestrator of all things, right? In many parts of the world, you experience the changing seasons, right? We, we experience extreme days of heat without end, and we suppose, but, but, but one day a cool breeze begins to usher ever so lightly from the north, bringing with us freshness and a new season, Right? And we oftentimes wonder when the rain begins, will it stop? Or when the floodwaters come, will they recede? We look towards the heavens for relief from the hail and from the snow. And, and then one day the spring rains come and the flowers begin to bloom. This is our God, the one who orchestrates the newness of life, the, the new beginnings and the end. He brings life and he also brings death because all things he has created for his good pleasure and for his purpose. 
So once that purpose is fulfilled, life continues in the way God has designed it to be for his unique purpose. Point two, as I stated, a still small voice, a still small voice, right? He will not cry out, nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street, right? Then he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. Going back to Elijah's again. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore into the mountain and broke into the rocks, uh, rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. This man was on the run for his entire life, even though God had given him all the tools and mechanisms to do the will of God, and he had done it successfully. Stopped the rain from falling for three years, for three years right? Killed all the priests of Baal, right? And yet, feared for his life, ran and hid, and God asked him, why are you here, right? Because I have a unique purpose for you in life, and I'm not done with you yet. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, the bread of life to eat. And I will give him a white stone, and on that stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. Our God simply is one who whispers in the midst of chaos, right? Think about that. You ever been in a situation where, you know, you're, you're in a chaotic situation that says, you know, I have a headache, let me go someplace and lay down. It's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. Go someplace and be at peace with yourself, right? And figure it out, right? Know that it's not just you sitting alone trying to figure this out or lying alone trying to figure this out. That, the, that gives the, 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 the Holy Spirit an opportunity to whisper to you, to tell you, to comfort you, to tell you that here is a solution to your problem. Everything is going to be okay. It is not the end of the world. Things are going to get better. Wake up tomorrow and do these three things, and God will work it out for your good. He is a God who directs with his finger when we need direction. He is a God who carries us across the hidden moats of death and darkness. He is this God of multitude, of a multitude of chances to the nations who choose not to believe. We have a lot to pray for in our country today. There is so much unrest unfaithfulness, unrighteousness that goes on, right? Children despising their parents, right? Gun violence, right? Just one thing after another, the lies and deceit, all these things which are not in God's good grace, right? Are affecting our nation and turning our nation upside down. Namely because many millions have chosen not to go to church. Think about that when you get a chance. How many times have you seen an incident on television and you, you never hear a pastor come out and say, oh, he was a good kid in Sunday school, right? Or she was a good kid in Sunday school, right? Or he led the choir. This is, you never hear about uh, uh, the pastor or religious leader come on and say, I cannot believe this has happened, but let's pray for their soul, right? Because there has been this, this long uh, there's for, for a very, very long time, people have walked away from church. They don't, parents don't get up and take their children to church anymore, and they don't go to church anymore. So now there is no moral base. Hmm. He's this God, and he gives us a multitude of chances, but I can only give you so much slack before I tighten it up. And though he has poured out his flesh among all men, there will be many who will miss it and choose to walk away from the simplicity of following him and submitting to his loving will. We are all too familiar with Matthew 11 and 29, right? Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. The New Living Translation says, let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest. For your souls. So lastly, the reason why you won't hear the trumpets blow and an army of 10,000 parading down the streets in all pomp and circumstances because he is a God that resides in your heart. He is closer to you than a brother or a sister or a mother or a father. So you're not going to hear a loud noise. You're going to hear a whisper from God. He lives in your heart and he has been living there since 
The book of Acts, the second chapter, when the Holy Spirit was poured upon all men, you just have to unlock it and stir it up and he will speak to you. And not only that, Joshua 1 and 9 says, have I not commanded you? Get this. Be strong and be of good courage. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Amen. Deuteronomy 31, 6 says, be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be dread. Be in dread of, him, of them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. And then lastly, Zephaniah 3 and 17, the Lord your God is in the midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will unite you with, uh, by the love. He will exult over you with loud singing. So God is not one who will yell and scream of his piety and his deity, but will simply knock at the far reaches of your heart, amen, and await a response from you. It is up to you, right? He will not call out or raise his voice, amen, but he will just simply knock on the boundaries of your heart. Point three, I am the Lord, that is my name. A bruised reed he will not break. Whew. And smoking flax he will not quench, and he will bring forth justice for truth. And as I stated, going back to the book of Luke, what did you go out to see? A reed shaking in the wind? And so when the Pharisees and Sadducees go back and read their texts in Scripture and go back to the book of Isaiah and talk about the reed, what, okay, this, how does Jesus know about these things, right? So what he's saying here is that a bruised reed he will not break, smoking flax he will not quench, and he will bring forth justice for truth, right? Just to give you an example, I found a very young Japanese maple on sale at the store, you know, few years back and brought it home, this little tree and planted it and which began to the process of, we began the process of watching it take shape and grow with leaves and the first several months, no problem, the tree adjusted to the soil and made it through the harsh winter months. So this spring and summer, a much different story began to sway as a result of its weight and its strength. And I had to come up with a solution. So I drove a PVC pipe next to it and tie the pipe to it to provide additional strength during the growth process. Amen. So I plan to leave this pipe there until the tree is able to stand erect on its own. And the reason why is because this is God, this is the Holy Spirit, that when we begin to sway and our branches break but not break off, right, that God is there able to fix us and not forsake us, to continue to give us strength and support as we continue to grow on our Christian journey. So in conclusion, I have much more to say, John 16 and 12. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. And he will not speak on his own and he will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. And he will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. So all that belongs to the Father is mine, and that is why I said the Spirit will receive me from me what he will make known to you, John 16 and 12. So our focus today was, I am the Lord, that is my name. Because in verse 6 of this passage of Scripture, he says that I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, church, and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people for a light to the Gentiles, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and then sit in darkness out in the prison house. In verse 8, I am the Lord, and that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. So this is the God we serve, right? I am the Lord. That is my name, right? And he is there. So as the candle begins to go out, it says that I will not allow that candle light to go out. That's the God that I serve. Because of your unfaithfulness, your unrighteousness, and because you're wavering, I will continue to allow that candle light to shine. And as the branches of your life become withered and break, but not break off, bend, right, but not descend, that God will find a way to erect and find a way, find a solution to hold you upright while you're going through 
your growth process. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for who you are today and thank you for all the blessings that you have given us today and even though we don't deserve them for you are the God and that is who you are. So we thank you, Lord, for telling us about this servant, Israel, and then later telling us that you will be sending your son who will be the one who will save all of Israel and all of the Gentiles from sin. So, Lord, bless us and keep us on this day. Cleanse our hearts, Lord Jesus. Create a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within us, Lord Jesus, and make us better people. Make us better, a better nation. Make us a better world. And, Lord, as the famines continue to uh, erupt all over the world and uh, water is becoming scarce and bombs are falling upon civilians and the lies and uh, all the unfaithfulness that has taken place in the world today, forgive us, for we don't know what we're doing. Create in all of us a clean heart and bless us and keep us, Lord Jesus, for we cannot do this without you. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that, that, that one day that we will all fall to our knees or find a reason to fall to our knees and just ask you for a solution and not ask man. And that we will learn to listen to you more and serve you more, attend church more, tell our children to go to church more, go with our children to the church more, that we will once again have a moral base throughout society. So I ask this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.